rapidly evolving and escalating public health emergency. Uh, we have things happening, obviously, here on the ground in Louisiana, uh, but we're also following developments in Washington, D.C., out of the White House and uh, out of the halls of Congress. So it's more important than ever that we communicate accurately and timely uh, to get information uh, to the public. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking President Trump uh, for signing my request for a major disaster declaration for Louisiana. I submitted this request yesterday, and it was promptly approved last night. I also want to thank our congressional delegation um, because I know that they supported uh, our request for that declaration, and uh, that certainly includes all of them, but, but Senator Kennedy, who I know contacted the White House personally uh, last night uh, requesting uh, to the president that it be signed. This will speed the flow of funding to FEMA approved ex uh, for uh, FEMA approved expenditures and make crisis counseling available. The declaration should also allow for additional resources from the federal government and provide us with more tools and equipment to treat the sick and to increase our hospital capacity. This declaration brings Louisiana into the national conversation and ensures that we are not being left out of that conversation when talking about allocating resources to hard hit areas around the country. In total, um, and this may have changed just before I walked in, if it did, I apologize. Uh, there are five states currently with federal major disaster declarations, New York, California, Washington, Louisiana, and Iowa. It looks also like the Senate is poised to pass a relief package that will be immensely helpful. Uh, that language is still being ironed out, um, but we understand an agreement and principle is in place. Uh, we are working very hard, even right now, to get our hands on that language so that we can lean as far forward as possible to identify all of the benefits that we can take advantage of, whether it's funding, flexibility, uh, any other measures uh, that will provide assistance to Louisiana, to Louisiana itself, uh, to local government, to uh, businesses and employees, uh, you name it, we are looking uh, for uh, every bit of assistance that we can make available so that we can do that just as quickly as possible. We, all, uh, we also have concerns about making sure that uh, there is relief, especially for workers who are not employees. They may be self-employed or they may be 1099 uh, contract employ uh, individuals. So, so they're not eligible for traditional unemployment benefits and we're receiving a lot of inquiries from uh, these individuals. We believe that there will be some assistance in this regard in the bill, but it's not certain yet what that looks like. Um, I want to get to today's uh, case count, which we update now every day at noon. And I will tell you the case count is very sobering. You can see it here. Uh, we now have 1,795 cases in the state of Louisiana and 65 deaths uh, that are attributable to COVID-19. Uh, that is an increase of 407 cases since yesterday, and sadly, that is an increase of 19 deaths. Uh, as I understand it, there are 48 of our 64 parishes presently with a positive case of COVID, uh, but I can assure the public uh, COVID is present in every single parish across the state, and so nobody should look at that map uh, and think, oh, I live in one of the parishes that's still showing a zero. Uh, this virus uh, has spread across the state of Louisiana. This is real. And our state and everyone in it needs to take it very seriously. It is of the utmost importance that we follow the mitigation measures that we have in place. These are measures that we know will work, but they will only work to the degree that people comply with them. Uh, and so I am urging all Louisianans, again, to make sure that you're doing what we've asked of you. Uh, make sure that you are limiting contact, limiting travel, doing only essential things when you leave the house and not leaving the house more than is absolutely necessary. Uh, follow those social distancing uh, guidelines. Uh, keep six feet from yourself and someone else when you just have to be in the presence of other individuals. Make sure that you continue to wash your hands with soap and water vigorously for 20 seconds. Use hand sanitizer when soap and water isn't available control your cough. Stay home when you are sick. Uh, that is That remains critically important. And I do want to thank everyone across the state of Louisiana who are heeding these measures. 
we know that compliance is increasing, but we also know we are not where we need to be. Everyone needs to do their part to fight this virus. Uh, and we're going to have to stick with these measures as long as it takes to make them pay off. We have to start flattening the curve. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, and so we have to slow the spread and extend the duration of this again so that we do not present more patients to the hospitals than we have the capacity to care for. We have all watched this play out in the previous weeks and months in other places around the globe. And now we're seeing it play out around the United States and right here in Louisiana. With the numbers where they are, we are already placing severe demand on our hospitals and on our personal protective equipment. You hear this quite often referred to as PPE. Let me be clear about this. Our ventilator capacity is far from okay in Louisiana. The problem isn't just that the cases are growing every day, it is that they're growing rapidly every day. And this alarming growth has a devastatingly fast impact on our resources and the ability to take care of people. You've heard me say previously that Louisiana saw the fastest growth rate in positive COVID-19 cases in the first two weeks than just about anywhere else in the world. As previously mentioned also, uh, one of the consequences of this uh, is ventilator capacity. And in fact, in talking to the Department of Health and the Office of Public Health, this is probably the most significant near-term issue related to our capacity to treat COVID-19 patients. Uh, we're not unique in this regard. You've seen other states uh, making the same uh, statements. And it's not all due to COVID-19, by the way. There are always uh, patients in the hospital, especially during flu season, and we're on the tail end of flu season, but it is still a significant factor in our state, and other patients in the hospital at any given time with respiratory problems that, that require them to be on a vent. Uh, their treatment requires that ventilator. They require that ventilator to live. And then you add to that the increasing number of COVID patients who need uh, ventilators, and that's why we are seeing uh, the, the capacity uh, with respect to ventilators be eroded in a way that, quite frankly, is alarming. If our growth continues, uh, we could potentially run out of vents in the New Orleans area in the first week in April. And of course, this depends upon whether the curve gets flattened or whether the tra trajectory uh, stays where it is. And it also depends on our ability to procure and allocate timely, ahead of the first week in April, additional uh, ventilators. There is a tiny bit of good news. We're actually distributing 100 ventilators today to the Region 1 area around New Orleans. Uh, we do believe that over the next few days, tomorrow, uh, there will be another 100 ventilators. Uh, and we think that we may have access to an additional 100 ventilators uh, early next week. Um, but I don't count tomorrow's and I don't count next week because we don't have them in hand. But assuming we get those ventilators, that's a total of 300 that we will have allocated, and we're gonna to continue to try to get more. But even if we allocate all 300 of those, we know just in region one, we're still 600 ventilators short. And we haven't even begun to get to the Baton Rouge area and the, the Shreveport area, and they're gonna need additional ventilator capacity as well. Uh, and with respect to ventilators, we're competing with every other state in the nation, and we're competing with many other countries across the globe as well. Uh, not just for ventilators, but that remains the case uh, for acquisition of PPE, things like masks and gloves. Uh, and uh, we have requested uh, and we have received supplies from the national stockpile and from private vendors as well. Uh, and we are grateful. Uh, that we've been able to receive what we have, but quite frankly, it is not enough. Uh, we zero out the warehouse every day. Uh, we receive supplies, break down the supplies, and usually turn them around in about 24 hours. Uh, to make this happen, the National Guard, the soldiers and airmen are working extremely hard, doing some uh, ter terrific work for all of us, but they're making shipments as late as three o'clock in the morning, or I guess you could say as early uh, as three o'clock in the morning. Uh, most of the masks that we have received up to date, uh, and it's about 100,000 of these N95 masks, most of those have come from the Strategic National Stockpile. 
Uh, a, little, a little bit of good news. I've been in contact today with Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. Apple is donating 100,000 N95 masks to the state of Louisiana. Uh, we hope to have those um, in our state, in our warehouse, so that we can allocate them very, very quickly. And I want to thank him uh, and the generosity of the people at, at uh, Apple for making that possible. Uh, to say that demand is outpacing supply would be a gross understatement. As you've heard me say over and over again, our health care workers are heroes, and they're working extremely hard under difficult circumstances uh, in order to preserve life. Uh, and, and I want to thank them again, and I'm asking everyone to lift them up in prayer and do what we can to support uh, those individuals, one of which is uh, making sure that you're doing what we're asking you to do with respect to the mitigation measures so that we can uh, reduce the patient count, flatten the curve, and make their lives easier, make their PPE stretch further, and so forth. I want people to know that we're doing everything that we humanly can to deal with this emergency. And I thank all of our partners at local government, I thank all of our partners in the federal government, and certainly all of the people working uh, at the state level as well. Uh, but our efforts really are going to be in vain to a very large degree if we don't get uh, people to do their part by following the stay-at-home order that I issued on Sunday and that was effective at 5 p.m. on Monday. Um, I know that there are many people paying attention and abiding by those uh, the directions in that order, um, but I'm still hearing from um, some parts of, of the state where, where compliance is less than we would want it to be. And so I'm encouraging everybody to be a good neighbor. We know what it means to be a good neighbor to one another because we've been doing that for a long time. And we know how to come together in times of disaster and emergency. But this one is a little different. Rather than rushing to your neighbor uh, in order to provide assistance, you're a good neighbor when you stay away. And pick up the phone and call them. Uh, you can FaceTime them. You can Skype them. Check on them. Uh, and, and we want people to stay in contact with one another, but virtual contact not actual physical contact. Finally, I want to address those who are filing uh, for unemployment claims. I understand that many people are having problems resetting their passwords in order to file. If anyone needs assistance with their username and password, please email hire, H-I-R-E, hire at lwc.la.gov with the subject password reset and include in the email your name, phone number, and the last four digits of your social security number. Uh, we're also putting information on our website, which is la.gov.la slash coronavirus. As I said yesterday, our blood banks are critically low in supply, so if you're healthy and are not showing any symptoms, please consider donating blood. It is safe both to donate blood and to receive blood, but we are running low. Food banks are also running low on donations, and I know a lot of you are struggling, but if you are able to make a monetary donation to a food bank, please do that. As little as a dollar can sometimes feed up to four people. Uh, so I would ask you to go to feedinglouisiana.org and make that donation if you can. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving situation. We will continue to update you as, uh, as things are happen uh, and we have additional information to share with you as always i ask the people of louisiana to join uh, their prayers join your prayers to mine um, for healing and protection uh, we've been through many trials together we're going to get through this challenge uh, as well as one louisiana so with that um, i'm going to take your questions i do as uh, i normally do have dr alex b you here from the department of health uh, to address questions that may relate uh, to testing. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, on the ventilator issue, can you talk more about where exactly we're looking for ventilators? We've obviously also gotten a lot of national attention in recent days. How exactly does that help us? Uh, and, and you mentioned the federal stockpile. Are we getting vents from the federal stockpile? And if so, how many? Uh, I'm not aware of ventilators uh, from the federal stockpile. I'll, I'll get that answer uh, to you soon. Uh, we are contacting vendors, we, and, and by the way, our, our hospitals are also uh, trying to source uh, ventilators from the, the vendors that they would normally acquire them from. Uh, we, are, we are working a, a list of vendors as well 
uh, and we have requested them uh, through uh, the federal government. And again, I'll let you know whether we've gotten any uh, from the federal government soon. But this is a very, very difficult item to find uh, because everyone is looking for them all at the same time. And they're just, they're in very short supply. The demand is high. We do have additional strategies to create ventilator capacity by um, retrofitting e existing uh, breathing devices that are that are not really ventilators, but they can be made into uh, ventilators um, by retrofitting them and by changing them. And we're, we're identifying uh, those devices and making sure that our hospitals are, are, uh, are taking that into account and, and that we use that particular technique in order to increase our, our capacity as well. But this is the, the, the nearest term big issue related to capacity to render the care uh, in our hospitals that we n know that we're going to need based on current modeling. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to ask a question about um, housing of hospital patients. Will you guys ever consider using the Ernest um, and Memorial yeah. uh, Convention Center in New Orleans? Yeah, so we, we have several strategies, and we're going to be making an announcement very soon uh, because we know we need additional medical monitoring uh, capacity. It would be like a step-down unit. Um, one of the ways that we can increase the capacity of our hospitals to deliver care to more patients is when a patient is sufficiently recovered and no longer needs to be in an acute care bed or an ICU bed, that we have another place where they can go. That frees that bed up, makes it available to someone who does need that level of services. And so we have some strategies that we are looking at that we're going to make an announcement on very, very soon. I will tell you we are uh, giving consideration to the Montreal Convention Center uh, for this and, and some other uh, places as well. Uh, and we will, we will have uh, more information soon on that. Yes, ma'am. And another question is, I see the numbers here, but can you elaborate on how many people may have recovered from yeah. this uh, virus? Well, first of all, it would be entirely speculative uh, for me to say that we have had one person, 10 people, 100 people recovered uh, because it's not something that, that, that we are able to track a, at this time. And by the way, the the method or the the um, we're actually looking to CDC for guidance as to what criteria needs to be met before we can buy someone, before we can say that they are, in fact, uh, recovered. I don't believe any state in the nation right now is reporting uh, data with respect to recovered individuals. Uh, and, and I, in fact, I, I'm just going to ask Dr. B. He's, he's uh, sitting over there and he's waiting to uh, come up in here, uh, come up here and, and, and respond to a question. And I know that he, he knows more about this than I do. Yeah, so I, as, as the governor said, we're not aware of states that are able to, to you know, report that uh, at a large uh, volume you know, with our entire population. We do know that people recover and, and that, you know, most people that have COVID um, are, are having mild illnesses. The, the CDC has, you know, given us recommendations on identifying people who recovered both by testing, which these days is not our preferred method because we want tests to be going to finding folks who need to, to know their status. Rather, we're looking at symptoms. So the CDC says, if your fever is completely recovered without having to take a medication to get your fever down, and your symptoms are significantly improved for three days in a row, we would consider that your, your COVID is likely recovered. The challenge is we have to talk with individuals to get that information. And so you know, what we're looking at is how would we as a state uh, have that information? I think most importantly, we want to make sure the folks who need care at the moment uh, are where we're focusing our efforts. Thank you. Yes, sir. I guess maybe another question for Dr. B. Um, about 35% of the fatalities are individuals that are 60 or younger. What, what do you make out of that when you take a look at the age ranges of the people who are dying? So, uh, you know, any, any death related to, to COVID is tragic. We are uh, looking at this data, not only in the state of Louisiana, but across the country. I think you know, early on, we had data from China, from Korea, uh, more data coming from Italy, and it does look like our populations may be a little bit different. We know that the kinds of things that put somebody at risk for not doing well with COVID are not only age, but also underlying medical conditions. And so when you think about the things that we're looking at, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, you know, other uh, concerns to the immune system, it may be that, and we know that we have uh, more of that uh, in our state than, than uh, potentially in some of these other populations. And that may be one of the reasons that we're seeing those numbers. Yes, Melinda. 
Um, in, in terms of the, it's along the same lines as the convention center, I, I know the letter that you sent seeking the federal disaster declaration also talked about Louisiana buying trailers, and um, the UL system president talked about dorms as possible locations for housing yeah. people after they leave the hospital. Are, are those still being considered as well? Well, we were, we were, we cast a wide net to take an inventory of available spaces that could be used uh, as um, these medical monitoring stations, um, these step-down units that, were, that we just talked about. And, and we wanted to find out what the inventory was, get the, the doctors together, get the National Guard together to figure out what would be required to, to stand them up as an operational step-down unit and which would be the most desirable uh, from the, a medical perspective, especially as it relates to, to staffing. Uh, and so, so I will tell you there, there were a lot of things looked at, uh, including dorms, uh, which are not uh, being used currently um, uh, on most of our campuses, or at least not, not uh, to the degree that they have been in the past. Um, but I, it is, I can tell you we are no longer presently looking at dormitories. Um, and we, we are presently continuing to look at hotels in, in various parts of the state. Uh, that may be able to serve uh, this function. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, and I mentioned this before, um, when, you, when you create what is essentially a hospital, but it is not connected to an existing hospital, the staffing becomes a real challenge. Uh, and, and staffing is, is even a bigger challenge if you create lots of smaller hospitals uh, and then you have the logistical problems of getting the staffing to where they need to go, but you also have to get all of the supplies, the PPE, the pharmacy, the wraparound services that you need. Um, and so as, as we worked through this, uh, we inevitably uh, worked our way towards uh, looking at a large capacity facility where we think we can build uh, out rapidly the, the capacity that we need from bed space to equipment, uh, and, and then have a, a, a much uh, easier, but not easy, uh, time to, to staff as well. Um, and so that's why we, some of the areas that we initially considered are, are no longer on the table, correct? Today is the biggest one-day spike in both cases and yeah. deaths. Is that an indication that it's still on a worst-case trajectory or just more testing? What's well, it's, it's both, and we need, we need more data. And I say both. I'm not hedging, but it's, it's a fact. Um, that we went from about 6,000 tests in the aggregate as of yesterday to more than 11,000 today. Um, and so we almost doubled the number of tests that had been administered. The good news is we didn't double the number of cases, but the number of cases that, that uh, were new and added today were 407. Yesterday that number was 216. The day before was 335. And so until you have more data points, you don't really know. I am, I am troubled because if you just look at this from a perspective of case growth, we, sh we are staying on, on that curve that, that we were on before. But more testing is always a good thing because the facts are whatever they are, and, and we, we hate being in the dark. And so we, we like having more testing, and, and I assume that the number of tests administered every day will continue. Uh, to rise for some time, giving us a clearer picture of what we're dealing with. Uh, but the trajectory of our case growth uh, continues to be very alarming. Uh, we have not begun to flatten the curve yet, and that is the number one message that I'm trying to deliver to the state of Louisiana. We have a long way to go. We have to do better at our mitigation measures, and we need for those mitigation measures to start showing up in this data uh, before we can draw uh, an easy breath. Sam? Governor, back on the ventilator issue, have you guys requested ventilators from the federal government? And if so, how many? And also, what is a projection for how many people are going to need ventilators that's part of that model you talked about for the New Orleans region? I, I am showing that we have requested uh, about 2,000 uh, ventilators. Uh, I am unable to tell you presently with the information I'm looking at how many of those would have been requested from the federal government via the national stockpile how many that we're trying to source uh, from a vendor. Uh, so, Sam, I just owe you some more information on that. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question was what? Um, 
What's the, you talked about this projection that we're going to run out of ventilators in the New Orleans area. Um, how many people do we project are going to need ventilators that underlies that uh, prediction? Um, obviously more than we have. I, I, don't, I don't have that number with me um, at, at the moment, um, but I will, I will get that information to you I as well. Um, you know, it, we have, we have, uh, uh, we're looking at information and it, and it changes a little bit every day, both as to, to what, uh, we believe the demand is going to be and what, what we think the supply is going to be. Obviously the, the supply isn't growing, uh, anywhere near enough to make us feel comfortable. Uh, but, but we, we know that in, in the first week in April, uh, we run a, a significant risk of not having the ventilators that we need to treat the patients who will require uh, ventilators for, for proper treatment in Region 1, in that area around New Orleans. Uh, but but uh, you can look at the case numbers in the Baton Rouge uh, and Ascension area and then go up to Caddo and, and Bossier, and you know that, that there's every likelihood that they're shortly behind that. And so, so ventilators are critically important. Greg. Outside of people's primary concern for people's safety and health, and, and the, the most more feedback I'm still getting is that they need some guidance for for students and their parents as far yeah. as, and I know I asked you this yesterday, and you said that the Department of Ed was working on it, but whether or not these students, if they don't go back to school, will be advanced to grade. Yeah. Is there, are they any closer to deciding those scenarios yet? Well, they're one day closer, but I don't have any more information than that uh, to share with people. And, and anything that I said right now uh, would be more speculative than fact. And I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. They're, they're working. It's going to depend on how long the schools are out. Uh, how much, if, if, if they go back this year, how much time do they have uh, to administer tests and so forth? But, but I can assure you the Department of Education, led now by Beth CNO, uh, under uh, the direction of the Bessie Board, they, they are working on this and they're working in coordination with our school district superintendents around the state of Louisiana. In the meantime, I encourage every parent, every, everybody out there who has these children uh, who we all agree should be in school, but it's unfortunate they can't be, try to keep them engaged uh, in, in things that are educational in nature. Uh, and we have programming on LPB, we have distance learning, we have information that is flowing every single day uh, through school districts to principals and teachers, uh, and we're trying to get that information to parents. And so I encourage them to, to do that. We don't want, regardless of when they go back, because I can't answer that question today, we want the least amount of regression, uh, regression to happen uh, with respect to these children's education in that time period. Leo, did you have a question? Matter of fact, I did. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to find out if, since so many forecasters on, on Wall Street now are saying that we could be off 30 percent for GDP for the second quarter, the first down quarter in 129 quarters, almost 11 years, we're caught in the unique situation of where we are at the mercy of the crossfire between Russia and the Saudis, yeah. and we're now $30 under what our budget is based on. At the same time, when you're expending money that we really didn't have, are we operating out of a surplus right now? Or where's the money coming from to handle this, because we're now, what, $120 million into this? We are, and, and we, as, as you know, we had a supplemental bill um, pending before uh, the legislature based on the uh, REC meeting that where the, the uh, forecast was not adopted, but it showed a current year excess. Uh, obviously, we are, we are eroding uh, that excess, uh, and, and these expenditures are an issue, um, but, but I'm, I don't, I'm not going to stand here today and tell you we are, we are at a deficit because I don't believe that that's the case. Secondly, one of the things that the bill uh, has in it that, that will be available within 30 days of President Trump signing it, and it still has to be passed by the Senate uh, and the House and signed by the President, is direct aid uh, to states. Uh, and it, my understanding uh, of the language as it was when, when I was briefed on it, and, and assuming it doesn't change, is there will be some funding in there for all 50 states um, and, and that will be very, very helpful. 
but they're also going to have some funding in there for hospitals. And to the degree that they can fund hospitals, then that's money that we then don't have to spend on hospitals, have uh, to spend on, on other things. Uh, and then I would incur uh, remind you that, that uh, the spending that we're doing uh, that is uh, uh, working its way through FEMA is a 75-25 uh, split. Uh, so that's very helpful. We also know that the FMAP, the percentage of the Medicaid uh, budget that we have to pay relative to what the federal government p uh, pays improved by 6.2% uh, because of the last bill that Congress actually did pass. And so there's some things that are working in our favor as well. Uh, I can't tell you that I'm, I'm unconcerned, but, but right now um, my, my biggest concern is this health emergency and, and, and we are moving forward with everything that we know that we can and should do in order to, to deal with this emergency. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I wanted to know, like, what's next when it, uh, when it comes to flattening the curve? Like, what's yeah. those projections like? And if you can add, answer, how will the convention center be staffed if you were to go that route? Well, yeah, I don't really understand your question about the curve. What, what comes next depends on the data point we receive uh, on the number of positive cases relative to the amount of testing that we do, and then we plot that. Um, as of right now, we haven't plotted a data point relative to cases that takes us off the trajectory that, that we've been talking about for many days now that is, that is alarming, uh, which is why these mitigation measures have to be successful. Uh, with respect to, to staffing whatever surge capacity that we create outside of an ex the existing footprint of a hospital, uh, we have contractual relationships with, with uh, entities uh, outside of Louisiana uh, that we are working on. We are also working uh, with uh, the uh, state uh, medical board, the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners, I think is what it's called, and the nursing board to try to figure out if we can do some things to, to bring more healthcare professionals online quicker. Uh, we are doing things with uh, medical schools. Uh, for example, we are trying to get uh, the most recent set of, of medical school graduates uh, credentialed, licensed sooner so that their residencies can start and they can be, whether they're actually uh, uh, in the uh, COVID arena or the non-COVID arena, it, it helps because, because either way that they are deployed and employed uh, can be very helpful. So that's, that's what we're looking at. In the back, yes ma'am. Yeah, we've received uh, many phone calls and emails about people who believe their workplace is not taking the proper precaution to keep their employees safe. Uh, where should we refer these people to their questions? Well, you know, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this statement now that there's plenty of guidance out there from the CDC uh, and from CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and we have been having conversations with leaders of, of industry in Louisiana, for example, the Oil and Gas Association, the Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association, the Chemical Association, and so forth, directing them to that CDC guidance and to that CISA guidance and, and, and pointing out that they, they can continue to operate as essential businesses, but there are ways that they have to do that in order to slow the spread of coronavirus and to protect their employees. Um, and, and so we are having those conversations with those entities. Um, and if there have been shortcomings uh, in, in the way that they've been operating, I fully expect that those are going to be addressed very, very quickly because we have pointed those out to those individuals. And as essential workers, they get hazard pay, those essential workers? I'm sorry, what? Are they entitled to, a lot of people are asking if they're entitled to hazard pay, I, I'm not aware of any hazard pay for private employees. That would be a, a function of their uh, or arrangement, th their agreement with, with their employer. This will be the last yes, one. Yes, sir. Together, along the same lines, I drove around downtown this morning and I watched workers cleaning windows, restriping pavement, mm -hmm. um, and even repainting a building. I understand the assisted guidelines are pretty clear about who is allowed to work and the types of industries they belong to, but is the guidance clear enough on the work itself that should be deemed essential? Oh, well, first of all, I think the guidelines are clear. People do need to read them uh, if they have questions, and we have three categories of businesses out there. Those that have been closed by the executive order or those that have been allowed to be opened by the executive order but with certain modifications, like our restaurants, for example, uh, that can be open but only for takeout, for drive-through, or delivery. Then you have a second category uh, that has been deemed essential. 
and those individ those businesses can continue to work. Their workers are deemed essential workers, but again, they have CDC guidance and CISA guidelines as to how they are to uh, function and and what they are supposed to do to protect their workers in terms of social distancing and so forth. Then you have a third category of businesses that are in neither of those categories, uh, and they get to remain open, uh, but they have to practice social distancing too and honor the 10 person uh, limit. Uh, and so this, we're, we're trying to strike the right balance uh, between allowing those essential activities to continue uh, and make sure that people have access to nutrition and drugs and, and gasoline and banks and so forth um, but but also uh, keep most people at home uh, complying with the, the, the stay at home order. Um, and so it's it's not as, as unclear as some people would would want it to be. Uh, and, and so, uh, for example, we always anticipated that even a business that, that needs to be closed, it can go in and continue uh, without being open to the public and do payroll. They can clean. They can they can do other things that are needed uh, for their businesses. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, on road construction projects where you don't see a high density of workers uh, who are coming into contact with one another, I think that's consistent with the guidance uh, that we've given. Look, I want to thank you all again for the opportunity uh, to speak to the people of Louisiana uh, through you all who are here in this room and those people who tuned in um, either on the radio uh, or on TV. And I want to encourage you all. Uh, to continue to do everything that you can to better comply with the mitigation measures that are in place through that stay at home order. Uh, I also want to encourage you uh, to continue to, to uh, join your prayers to mind for our state. And I can assure you we are going to get through this uh, and it's, it's a matter of time. Uh, but the difficulty that we have between now and then and how long it takes really is up to us. It is really up to us and, and it's gonna be faster and it's going to be better uh, if we will all engage in these mitigation measures and slow the spread uh, and not overwhelm our, our medical capacity uh, to deliver health care.